Good morning. Welcome to class. I uh, hope you're having a good week, a good start of the new week. We are uh, in this class. We're kind of shifting gears today and starting a new series. And uh, the uh, title of this series is uh, Spiritual Life Hacks. And it's uh, we're kind of drawing from a book with that title. And the author is Lynn Woods. And so uh, some good material and good thoughts on um, you know things that will help us in life. The term life hack is is kind of a, a new, uh, more relatively new term, and and so definition of a life hack is a strategy or technique adopted in order to manage one's time and daily activities in a more efficient way. Life hack. So some of you may have um, heard about these life hacks in other areas. Um, one, I will say, I'd never really thought about this before, um, so don't judge me, but they're, so baby wipes, right? They come in a nice little container. You want to keep them moist. You want to keep them uh, to where you can still use them. They don't dry out. They got that little snap tight seal lid on them, right? So uh, this one individual had found a way to recycle that snap piece of a baby wipe. They cut mm -hmm. it off, clean it really good, and they found some other kind of sticky adhesive or whatever, or maybe they could just, you can order those snaps. I don't know. I don't know how that works. Anyways, they would get a bag of Cheetos, and they would cut a rectangle out of the front, lay the bag on its side, and put that thing right there. Snap it open, grab some Cheetos, snap it back, keep it fresh, and lay the bag up in the storage sideways. Life hack. Life hack. You know that that there you if go. You could, if I could get the smell of baby wipes out of that or out yeah. of my head, right? Yeah, lemons flavored and scented Cheetos are no good. So you definitely want to. We, we're not recommending to try this at home, but it was bring the it idea week. that it would that. do that. That's your homework. That's do your that homework. Bring yeah. that next week. Bring lemon scented well, Cheetos next week. Okay, snack we'll on do. Those. I'll remember that. <laughs> so uh, today the the kind of topic of today's class in particular is what do you do when um, you know when it doesn't seem like God is doing anything in your life in other words you pray you have something going on you reach out to God you cry out to God and um, you reach out to God and help doesn't come you know so sometimes when we pray for help with things in our life, sometimes the answer does come fairly quickly. Uh, I, re I remember one time I was struggling with something, or it was relationship oriented, and I, I'd actually just kind of stopped what I was doing and I prayed about it. Before I could finish praying, the phone rings. So I, so I, I tell God to hold on just a second, I grab my phone, and the person on the other end of the phone is the one I was praying about and you know the conversation went well so it was it was like one of those wow kind of moments for me that uh, you know I was asking God for something and he answers it before I can even finish asking for it so sometimes I mean that those are awesome times when an answer comes quick but then what's hard is when you pray and pray and pray and it doesn't seem like anything is happening so what do we do what do you do and that's what today's class is about. So look at, flip it uh, in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. <clears throat> Exodus 2, verse 23. This is during the time of uh, Moses. So the Israelites are slaves in Egypt. And this is where uh, verse 23 says, During those many days the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned. So, um... This is kind of connecting the dots between uh, when Joseph was was in high position in Egypt. So everything was great for God's people because of Joseph, his status. But then, um, you know, a new king of Egypt comes, doesn't doesn't care, doesn't remember. We get fast forward, and so the people groan because of their slavery. They cried out for help. Their cry for rescue. Uh, their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning 
and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. So it's kind of, it's like the emphasis there is God, he, he heard, and he's going to answer, but you think about how much time went by between when they, how many times did the Israelites pray and nothing happened? You think about them being in slavery for 400 years. I mean, how many generations went by? You know, some are commendable because at this point in time, they're still praying. So, I mean, they still know who God is. It's not like they think God doesn't exist. You know, it's kind of... uh, kind of odd for them, you know, knowing all the history of their people and what all God has done for their, pe- their people to, again, continue turning away and then they go back and then turning away and come back. You know, we know that whole, mm-hmm. um, that issue just since creation. But now this is kind of the beginning of they're in slavery. Think about how hard that was for them. Is he entering? Is he there? Does he care? Is he listening? And this is kind of setting the stage for they are going to get out of this eventually. And then they're going to turn back to and back and forth, back and forth. But um, that's a long time. I mean, we're, it, it seems like whatever's happening in our lifetime is, is relevant. I mean, if we're going through a trial and it lasts, I mean, we talk about this all the time, but if the Internet goes out in our house for five minutes and shuts down and we have tried to figure out there's an outage, it should be repaired by, you know, two or three hours from now it's mm-hmm. I'm not even sure I'm not sure I'm going to make it I mean let's go ahead and set get the funeral arrangements done get the <laughs> casket I ain't going to make it you know we have that mentality so yeah. generations went by without something going on yet they still prayed yeah and why you know why did God <laughs> wait so long um, and I, I don't know that we know the answer to that but we do know during those 400 years and God takes what started with what 70 or 80 people and he takes that number and when they come out of Egypt we don't have a we don't have an accurate number but some estimate it could have been you know upwards of two three million Israelites coming out of Egypt so that's what happens in 400 years basically a nation is created um, and so maybe that's part of why God waited because he's letting this nation grow in this in this you know uh, state yes they're in slavery but but the day's coming so um, and then we have you know you look at Moses um, and that's you know this passage that we just read in Exodus 2 gets down to the end of chapter 2 and then the first of chapter 3 says Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro the priest of Midian and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness came to Horeb the mountain of God and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame so and this is the the burning bush flame of fire uh, in the midst of a bush well revenge like back up a little bit so Moses he grows up in Pharaoh's household remember Pharaoh's daughter took him um, he grows up in Pharaoh's household but he knows he's an Israelite and he actually left that lifestyle and he he's an Israelite and so there's that incident of him uh, defending a an Israelite slave from a, an Egyptian and Moses ends up killing the Egyptian well, the next day, he intervenes between two Israelites who are arguing, and, and they kind of turn on him. What are you going to do? You know, you're going to kill us like you did the Egyptian? And Moses is trying to do something. So he doesn't know what to do. He doesn't have, God's not telling him what to do. He's trying to help his people somehow. He ends up fleeing, and for years, he is with his father-in-law. Um, years go by. And Moses, no doubt, is praying, and nothing happens. So, we, you know, you talk about when we have times when we pray and it's not getting better, we pray it's not getting better. Well, not only um, is that not entirely, um, it's not uncommon, or it, and it doesn't mean something's wrong either. So we have examples, numerous examples in Scripture, and Moses is a good one. All this time, what is he doing or uh, let's ask this question: What is God doing? You know, why is why is God not doing something? Well, God has a big plan. 
You know, he God is doing something, and it's going to happen in the right time per God's wisdom. So during this time, all these days go by, uh, all these prayers are offered up to God, and what, you know, what did Moses think? Did he think God didn't care anymore? Did he think God, maybe God rejected him? Um, you wonder, did the Israelites think, you know, maybe we're not even praying to a real God? Uh, surely people had all types of doubts. But bottom line is, and really the bottom line of this class is, we cannot, we cannot see all the things God is doing and all the things he's orchestrating and all his plans. And we, have, we just have a little glimpse of what's going on. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think Hebrews 11 in the beginning of is just in talking about faith is really good for us to, to focus on as well. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So we have faith that God is working. We can't, we don't always, like you said, we don't always get to see God working. You know, I mean, even in other times in the past, just talking about God gives the increase. You may plant the seed, somebody else may water, God gives the increase. So we never know what kind of a seed we're planting, and each decision that we make, it doesn't always have to be, um, you know, us coming in to rescue, a, a, you know, a nation from, from an evil dictator, an evil king, or pharaoh. Uh, just a simple offer of prayer for someone that's going through a rough patch or offered a phone call or a text. Um, we never know just how, sometimes we never know, sometimes we do, but sometimes we never know just how impactful that, what we thought was kind of a small gesture to someone, how much light it brings to their life and helps them out in a difficult situation. We don't know the bad things they were dealing with, so then we don't necessarily know how much relief it brought to them that, you know, they thought that nobody cared about them, that they're in this all alone, and then they get a text. Hey, you know, just was thinking about you today. Hope you're doing well. I know here a while back you had, you know, some, some health troubles or some job issues, and just want to let you know we're praying for you and thinking about you. What a difference that can make. And just because we don't get to see, I think our, our brains might explode if we tried to mm -hmm. even comprehend a tenth of what God's doing over the entire earth. We want to sit here and act like ours is the most, obviously, the most important thing that God could be dealing with right now. So why is he not answering us? Uh, if he let the Israelites, you know, or, or, you know, his chosen people be slaves for 400 years, why do I think that I get immediate attention when I have something that, you know, right. inconveniences me? Um, but then again, too, it goes back to maybe God's, plan is for me to learn in that situation. Maybe the plan is for me in a bad situation to trust God more, to lean right. on Him more, not to have the situation taken from me. I mean, we think about when, you know, older individuals might talk about their kids and we go through trials, you just want to fix it for them. But then again, what do they learn through it? That somebody's just going to take care of it for them or they need to learn how to get through it. So, you know, I think many times He's trying to teach us Lean on me. Right now you're leaning on your strength. You're leaning on your abilities. You need to let that go. Turn to me and lean on lean on me. Yeah, and we you know, we have a couple <laughs> examples in scripture. Um one is Paul, where Paul asked for his thorn to be removed three times. So he asked, waited, asked, waited, asked, waited. And finally God said, No, it, you know, you need this. You need that thorn because it causes you to lean on me so yeah sometimes we need you know god's not going to perfect our situation because we're better spiritually the way it is and then we have a whole book of the bible job where <laughs> the situation with job god is god is uh seeing if job will be faithful will he will he be faithful when times are not easy and it was you know, yes, is this contest between God and Satan, but you know, our our whole life that's that's really what it's about is are, are we going to be faithful? We have a chance, 
and a choice. So sometimes when God doesn't, um, you know, answer our prayers, sometimes it's he's giving us a chance to show, are we going to honor God when times are hard? When we were talking about, <clears throat> so the, this book has been, has been great and it, it's got some good points in it, but it caused me to think of uh, the situation in Esther. And it's interesting that, you know, God is not specifically mentioned in the whole book, but we can definitely see that, that God was at work. And that alone, kind of for us, you know, we can, there it's, we can see him working. They couldn't at the time, but we see God was working through the things that were happening with them. And so, you know, probably one of the most common verses, uh, most quoted verses out of Esther is in chapter 4 and verse 14. And it says, for, and this is Mordecai, uh, who has, was, in charge of taking care of, of Esther. Her parents were no longer uh, living, and so uh, this is Esther's already been chosen. The king got rid of his former queen and is searching for a new one. Esther's beautiful. She's chosen. Doesn't know why. Doesn't understand. There's a wicked man that's kind of the second in command to the king, and so Esther's brought in, and she doesn't really want to be there, and so Mordecai is instructing her, like, you have an opportunity to save your people, because the king doesn't know you're a Jew, and the evil second in um, Haman, second in command for the king, uh, wants to destroy all the Jews. He's tired of them all, and he, they won't, especially because of Mordecai, won't bow to him. And so, anyway, Esther's got this great opportunity to save her people and to do, uh, you know, work for God. And so he tells her in verse 14, Esther chapter 4 says, For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And one thing to get from that, I get a couple of things. One thing is probably the most common thing. Maybe you're in the position that you're in for a reason. Maybe you're, it's not meant to be, the problem is not meant to be taken away from you. Maybe you're in that situation, like I mentioned earlier, to trust more to have more patience, to have more peace, whatever way, in whatever way, to be relying on God more. And so, um, but the second thing that I, that it kind of reminds me of what we talked about last week with Elijah is that relief and deliverance for the Jews were going to rise from some other place if Esther didn't do it. You know, if God said he's going to take care of his people, he's going to take care of his people. And sometimes we think we're a little bit more uh, valuable to God than, than we are, and I don't mean that in... You know, understand what I mean that we think we're the only one that can accomplish God's will so if we don't you know if this is all on us if we don't act it's all over Mordecai is saying you know the relief for the Jews are gonna have is gonna happen somewhere else why not you why can't it be you in this position so don't you know don't shy away from what you can do in that situation um, so and just like with Elijah he thought he was the only prophet left the only one doing anything good and God said, well, you know, how about all these people who are still going to, who have not bound down to Baal, and here's this king, and whoever doesn't get killed by this king will get killed by this king, of Syria and, and Israel. And then after that, I'm going to appoint Elisha to be the prophet in your place, basically instead of you, because you're not irreplaceable, almost. It kind of seems like it was pointed at there. So um, maybe we're there for that purpose. Um don't think you can't do God's work where you're at. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, in all those examples, God is, one point is, God is always doing something. You know, we can rest assured that when we pray, God hears us. And, and that's part of the story of the Israelites. Uh, you know, God heard their cry. Well, he heard every one of their cries. And he knew the whole time. And he was working the whole time. Um, another Another story about God working is John chapter 5 and this is the the place where <clears throat> people uh, crippled people or uh, people with different ailments would be would either go to or be brought to this pool uh, in Jerusalem and there was this belief that periodically an angel would come stir the water and the first one in gets healed and so people would gather around this pool well, Jesus comes one day and he winds up healing a man who had been crippled for 38 years 
So what does this man do? He And Jesus tells him um, when he heals him, he says, get up, take your bed, and walk. <clears throat> get your bed. Well, it would be a mat that he would probably roll up. So he gets up, he does that, he, all of a sudden he can walk, he's, you know, rejoicing. And what happens but um, the Pharisees get frustrated with the man because, you know, who, what are you doing, what are you doing walking? Um, in fact, verse 10, the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. Well, that's not exactly true. Uh, God said, "Don't work on the Sabbath." And then the Jews, in their in their being legalistic, they the Jewish leaders had uh, determined. Well, they had to define what work was, and they got so legalistic on what they deemed uh, the definition of work that this man who's lying down on the floor on a mat, if he rolls his mat up on the Sabbath, that's work to the Jews. So they went way beyond what God, what God's law did. Nevertheless, uh, they were frustrated with Jesus about it, and Jesus eventually makes a statement to the Jews. He says, um, my father is working until now, and I'm working. And uh, the NIV says, I like the NIV's reading on this, where Jesus says, my father is always at work to this very day. Um, and it's a reminder to us that it doesn't matter if we're, if you're taking a nap, if you're sleeping, if you're, whatever you're doing, guess what? God's working. And when we pray and we don't see an answer, we don't see an answer, we, uh, we can rest assured it's not because God's not doing anything. Um, we may not know what he's doing, but he's doing something. I like how um, in in this book, one of the illustrations that the author gives is like just kind of a reminder for us, almost kind of a humbling experience is, he says, you know what I do? And he actually makes a reference to the movie Castaway, and I don't know for anybody that's seen it, but, you know, a, a, a FedEx employee gets the plane crash, and he's the lone survivor on this island and tracks for so many days, and I don't remember how many, day, how many days it went, learns how to survive doesn't give up, starts to kind of have, you know, lose hope and decides he's just got to venture out, builds a makeshift boat, ends up getting seen by a merchant vessel and gets saved and then goes back to find out that the fiance he had before the wreck or for the plane crash had moved on after searching for him for a long time, moved on and moved on without him. And so uh, one of the characters in there, I guess, at the end of the film, I didn't really remember this part. It didn't stand out to me, I guess, until now, but um, says, I just I had to keep on breathing. And there are some times when your the win for your current battle is just to keep going, just to keep pushing forward, rely on God for his strength day by day, just keep going. Because uh, the enemy would love, when he gets you to that point, you have two decisions. Maybe I should just quit, keep, you know, quit going. This is right here is where I should give up. And just keep breathing. Like, even if that's, that's still a victory. Just keep going. Get, just keep pressing forward. We don't know what exactly God may be doing to bring you relief. I mean, have, just think about the Israelites for, for all those years being tortured and slavery and working and laboring. They thought, "What's the point? Why keep going?" So they keep going. But then he gives an He gives this idea of that what he does is he'll curl up his thumb and his fingers, and he kind of makes himself a little makeshift telescope or a spy glass, looking glass. And says, when I th begin to think that maybe God's just not really paying attention to me, I take up, you know, I roll up my finger like that, my thumb, and I pull out my hand and kind of look around and, and through my eye and look at the things around me. And that reminds me of how limited and how small my scope of things really is. Uh, when, when I think that I can see everything in reality, I'm only seeing what I'm experiencing and what's right in front of me. I don't know... I can't see how God is working all the time, and I can't see how God's working in other people's lives, maybe even to bring them into my life. And so remember just how small our vantage point is um, and how many examples that we have of God not leaving us, not forsaking us, and working behind the scenes. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a comforting thought, you know, to be in. And so that's my big takeaway from today's lesson is, 
is is just to remember <clears throat> there's so much I don't see that God's doing. You know, God's working. And um, you don't know but what tomorrow is going to be the day uh, that, or, or the next hour when, you know, when God's plan is revealed or when God's answer to our cries, you know, when's he going to rescue us? Well, God normally does things in a different way than we would do them. And, and it's always a better way, always a better way. So, um, we need more patience. We need more faith. Sometimes we just need to breathe, just need to hang on. And um, in that movie, I like uh, the book reference, the, the part uh, in that movie where uh, the character says, I need to breathe, and then he makes a statement that uh, because the raft that he made was out of a porta potty that washed up on shore. And so he makes a statement. He says, tomorrow's a new day, and who knows what's going to wash up on shore. You know, kind of figuratively like, figuratively, like who knows what that will bring. So hope. Hope, hope is a big deal, and uh, faith, hope, and love. Remember, hope is a big part of being a Christian in our, our walk with God. So hope that's uh, help for you today and this week, and uh, here in just a few minutes, we'll broadcast our worship, and uh, we'll do that together. So glad you're with us.